and Cancer Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are today, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. It is a great honor to be here this evening, to be part of this important symposium. This year, Avarian Cancer Australia is, is proud to present a compelling program featuring outstanding international and Australian experts, presenting the latest developments and advances in the rapidly evolving field of ovarian cancer research and treatment. And that includes genomics, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, PARP inhibitors, and many other things. And due to the unpredictable situation with COVID-19, the advisory committee made the decision earlier this year to hold the event virtually over four sessions, two evenings and two mornings. And this is the second session. I want to thank all of our excellent guest speakers for giving their time to be with us today. My particular thanks to the advisory group who were instrumental in pulling together today's program, Professor David Botel, Professor Anna DeFazio, Dr. Dale Garced, and our, our chair for today, Dr. Tarek Menyoi. As most of you will know, Avarian Cancer Australia is a national organization. It was founded in 2001 by people who wanted to provide support to women affected by ovarian cancer and their families and friends. And Ovarian Cancer Australia's vision is to save lives and ensure that no women with ovarian cancer experience this disease alone. And we're confident that holding these meetings with the generous sharing of ideas and expertise that is possible through these sorts of events contributes to achieving that vision. Ovarian Cancer Australia offers a, a range of support services for women and their families. That includes um, a helpline, telephone and face-to-face -face support groups, consumer forums, webinars, and an online forum. In addition, Ovarian Cancer Australia's TEAL support program is a free national telehealth outreach program. And that is specifically tailored to each individual, specialist ovarian cancer nurses, psychosocial counselors, and social workers support women throughout their diagnosis, treatment, and beyond that. The resources of Ovarian Cancer Australia, which provide women with information on diagnosis, treatment, well-being, and support services, are all free of charge, and they can be accessed through the Ovarian Cancer Australia website. I want to thank AstraZeneca for providing the funding to enable OCA to hold this symposium, and a special thank you to the Ovarian Cancer Australia support team for their extraordinary hard work and dedication that has brought this event to life and for everything else they do. So without further delay, we can begin session two of the 2021 Ovarian Cancer Symposium on Immunotherapy and Targeted Therapy. And I invite the chair of this session, Dr. Tarek Menyoi, medical oncologist from Western Australia, to the microphone. Over to you, Tarek, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian, and uh, thank you again to Ovarian Cancer Australia and AstraZeneca for supporting this uh, important virtual educational uh, initiative. And thank you all for uh, joining uh, from different time zones uh, that span today and both yesterday for uh, for our first speaker. Uh, so I just want to remind you at the beginning of the session uh, how to post a question. Uh, so at the right hand corner of your screen, you can click on uh, the Q&A tab and you'll see the option to post uh, a question. If your question has already been posted or something similar, then you can um, sort of upgrade that question by clicking on the arrow uh, that's right next to uh, the question. Uh, so today we have uh, three speakers. Um, uh, our first guest speaker is um, uh, known, I'm sure, to most of the audience. Uh, Dr. Elise uh, Cohn is joining us from um, uh, the US. She's joining us from the past, from Thursday night. Um, she is the head uh, of gynecological and neuroendocrine cancer therapeutics at the National Cancer Institute. 
uh, and she um, will give us the first uh, session titled uh, Not Your Average DNA Damage, Leveraging Underlying DNA Repair Dysfunction for uh, Benefit. Uh, over to Elise, and thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, this evening. Good evening, um, Alex, if you thank you. Um, I, it's a great pleasure um, to see you in my future um, tomorrow morning uh, from here on Thursday night to talk to you a little bit about leveraging DNA repair dysfunction. It's really a tremendous honor. Um, I'm only sad that I can't be for lots of reasons, including the fact that you have a beautiful, beautiful country. Next slide. I have no conflicts. And most of this discussion will involve off-label investigational approaches. Next slide, please. All right, so perhaps I'm giving away my age, but I did once upon a time enjoy Dr. Doolittle. And this is the famous push me, pull you. And I, I have the text there for you from the book. But the whole idea is when we put ideas together or we put molecules together or we put drugs together, sometimes they go in the same direction and sometimes they fight. Next slide, please. You can imagine with DNA, we can damage it or we can repair it. And they are obviously pushing and pulling. Next slide. DNA damage and DNA repair are a push me pull you. But on the next slide, we can see that if we inhibit repair and further damage, it creates an opportunity. Next slide. So with that in mind, I am delighted by the progress that we've made for our women with ovarian cancer, but like you somewhat chagrined that these data a decade, over a decade old, still stand today that a very small percentage of our women with especially advanced stage and high grade can ovarian cancer ever are cured. The next slide shows the important changes that we've had over the last decade include the introduction of maintenance therapies for first line treatment and second line treatment and a variety of new options such that our post progression survival is continuing to lengthen. So we have in effect improved the quantity and quality of life for our patients, but we've not done is improve the number of women who don't have to worry about what they're going to find at their next appointment. Next, please. So if we think about creating damage and inhibiting repair, let's think about the conventional wisdom. Chemotherapy injures DNA and kills cells. So more damage should mean more killing. Next slide. But the current vision is that we might need chemotherapy to initiate damage and then if we just inhibit repair, we might actually have a greater benefit. And if we figure out how to select drugs for the right patient, we should be able to not just improve what we do for women with ovarian cancer, but hopefully leverage it beyond. Next slide, please. But when we focus on ovarian cancer near and dear to all of us, we know chemotherapy can side or reduce. We know that high-grade serous ovarian cancer has a uniform G1S dysregulation because of the P53 mutation, whether it's gain of function or loss of function, we don't have a normal stopping point for repair. We know that platinum resistance also can be associated with increased changes in the cell cycle, such as work Professor Botel initiated demonstrating increase in the dynamic expression of cyclin E1. So again, if we think about how to combine the genotypes with drugs, we could improve killing. Next slide, please. So focusing not on so much on the picture, and you can, you're all welcome to these slides for some, of the, some, for some of the pictures, but what I want you to think about is we have two ways we can cause injury, endogenously by gene mutation and dysregulation of DNA repair or cell cycle progression genes 
altering division, augmenting mitotic and replication stress. And we can affect this also by exogenous exposures, such as DNA damaging agents, hypoxia, radiation therapy, that affect both locally within the body and at the local microenvironment. Next, please. These endogenous opportunities can lead to DNA injury, and many of these events are associated with augmented replication stress, an event that happens in G1S. As I noted, with p53 mutations, you don't have that checkpoint, cyclone amplification, RB loss, CDKN 2A loss, and MYC amplification all function in the same way. And then if we add the homologous recombination repair, dysfunction that we see either by mutation or other changes, we do have great opportunity to leverage. Next, please. The DNA repair pathways um, are all active in ovarian cancer. Mismatch repair, not as a driver, but single strand break and base excision repair are important because that's one of the sites for PARP inhibition activity. And also, XRCC1 coming to be a more important gene in the pathways. Homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining and alt end joining, they're more functional with, D they are involved with double strand breaks. As you can see just by the number of circles, they're incredibly complex with the number of elements involved. And we can think about those not so much as elements, but opportunities and key aspects are BRCA1 and BRCA2 as regulators of RAD51, the dynamic indicator of injury, ATM check two in G1S and ATR check one in WE1 in G2M. Next slide, please. That highlights those proteins I just described, talking about how we might be able to now focus on these proteins as therapeutic targets. Next, please. The cell cycle is an important contributor to DNA repair. If the cell cycle doesn't pause to allow repair, then we propagate injury, which in fact could be a positive for us as opposed to um, a hindrance. Because here, the G1S transition, which is normally affected by P53 and backed up by RB1, is the site of DNA unwinding, the replication requiring DNTPs, and ultimately, replication stress can cause the development of double strand breaks in this setting. Next, we also have some Achilles heel at the G2M transition where ATR check one and we one are involved in stopping the cells in G2M. If you can't fix things in G1S, you really got to fix them in G2 before you get to mitosis. If you push through mitosis, which is what happens when you inhibit the left side, ATR, check one or we one, then you allow that injury to be propagated and accumulated and causing injury to the cell. Next slide, please. These DNA damage repair proteins are targetable and can really pack a punch for us as we're learning now, with especially with the ATR program, CHECK1 and WE1, which are very active worldwide, and the developing targeting of ATM and DNA-PK. Next, please. These kinases mediate adaptation to replication stress. Replication stress, we look straight in the middle of the cartoon, occurs when you're trying to replicate that extra strand of DNA. And obviously it requires deoxyribonucleotides. Those are formed by ribonucleotide reductase, RRM. That is a target of gemcitabine. If you stall that replication for it, because you don't have enough DNTPs, you don't have enough beads to put on the chain, ultimately something breaks. And what happens is you get that double strand break. If you have injury and dysfunction and you don't repair, then that goes through to G2M. The smartest thing to do is to allow that to accumulate. Therefore, we would think about inhibiting ATR or CHECK1 or WE1. And we now see these combinations in the clinic in investigational use. Next, please. Replication stress becomes a major factor if you don't have the DNTPs. And as I described, 
RNR is the major regulator of the DNTP pool. And if we go all the way back to hydroxyurea, it's been a very important target for us for decades. In fact, what's intriguing is that this particular protein is upregulated in cervical and ovarian cancers. And perhaps that's why we see gemcitabine activity. But it may be that gemcitabine will be most active when we augment replication stress. And that occurs, in fact, when we develop platinum resistance. Next slide, please. So if we think about therapeutically increasing replication stress as a mechanism to better cause harm, we can think about taking tumor cells that may already have high replication stress because they've been exposed to a PARP inhibitor or to platinum, and maybe those patients will be susceptible to gemcitabine alone. And in fact, when gem came out, it was surprisingly active. Nowadays, we have different ladder against which we measure it. But if we think about normal cells or some subsets of tumor cells, in order to get to that replication stress susceptibility, we probably need that second hit. Next slide, please. If we look at work done by Constantinopoulos and colleagues, they demonstrated in the laboratory that you could improve replication stress, increase replication stress and improve outcome to gemcitabine when adding an ATR inhibitor and went on to run a clinical trial published last year in the Lancet Oncology using gemcitabine plus or minus the ATR inhibitor Berzacertib, previously known as VX970 or M6620. So here we're taking inhibition of ribonucleotide reductase, adding inhibition of ATR, and what you see is a small but real difference in the outcome for the women who got bursacertib with their gemcitabine. In fact, importantly, it was given after gemcitabine, so we could inhibit RNR, cause the first step, and then increase replication stress. Next slide. Similar to that, and just recently published, is, the, is adding the we one adavacertib inhibitor to gemcitabine, asking essentially the same question. Both studies in platinum-resistant high-grade serous ovarian cancer, both studies demonstrating that inhibition of the stopping part of the G2M checkpoint by either blocking ATR or we one in both cases improves outcome for these women for whom we have very little for which we can make with which we can make progress. And um, we're hoping that there will be a subsequent follow-on trial of gemcitabine with Berzacertib coming out of the US NCI in the not too distant future. Next, please. Another approach is to target double-strand DNA repair that occurs in the G1S period, which is the non-homologous end joining. The idea being if you put two injury and inhibition of repair together in the same part of the cell cycle, we might in fact augment injury rather than a sequential. And the data on the left have been published by Wise et al. and demonstrate that in both low-grade and high-grade um, low grade on the left, high grade on the right, serous ovarian cancers, there's a small but real improvement when we add M3814, an oral DNA PK inhibitor, now known as Pepocertib, to pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Next slide, please. And here is the ongoing phase 11B dose escalation study looking to optimize dose of these two agents together and it's targeting both high-grade and low-grade serous ovarian cancer being run by Dr. Grisham. Next slide, please. We can also put two inhibitors together without necessarily having um, an injury agent because we know, especially in women who have had prior platinum or prior PARP inhibitors, that they've already sustained some level of DNA damage. And in this complex set of figures, which you can get from Nature Communications last year from Friona Simpkins and colleagues, she essentially looked at several different situations, BRCA2 wild type, BRCA2 reversion mutant, BRCA2 mutant, cyclin E amplified. And in each case, she saw some improvement when she added ATR inhibition to PARP inhibition. 
The interesting question when we go back to the pathways and think about it, do we need to knock hard with the PARP inhibitor and only give a sniff of ATR inhibition? Or is it more important to block ATR and only use a sniff of the PARP inhibitor? From a clinical standpoint, the latter is probably more tolerable for our patients, but scientifically it appears that it may also be the better approach. Next slide. So there is now her study um, just presented at ASCO a couple of weeks ago, Capri, Seralacertib, the oral ATR inhibitor, and Elaborib for women who have had a prior PARP inhibitor and progressed on it and had no intervening therapy. So you're looking at acquired PARP resistance. Next slide. Um, and what they showed was a surprising benefit for the women um, across the board, both in women who had BRCA1 or 2 mutation or a positive homologous recombination score. Now, this may not look overwhelming because the numbers are very small, but it's the first proof of principle in patients with ovarian cancer that two inhibitors can work together in a constructive fashion. This targeted maximizing both drugs while having to dose reduce both of them, and current work being done by herself and also by uh, Dr. Timothy Yap are trying to look at schedule um, using them intermittently and also sequentially, and we'll see where those take us. Next slide, please. Another way to capitalize on the cell cycle is to use a CHUK1-2 inhibitor. Unfortunately, that's been a much more difficult approach, and the best agent was Prexacertib. Unfortunately, it was not um, advanced for clinical development. But on the left, you can see work from Lee et al. published a couple of years ago demonstrating deep and prolonged benefit of Prexacertib as a single agent in platinum-resistant high-grade serous disease. And when she went on, uh, when they went on to look at it with uh, a PARP inhibitor, it's clear that you can increase mitosis, decrease apoptosis, and, uh, and have less DNA repair in combination. Next slide. Which was this, this was done by um, Jeff Shapiro and his colleagues and also presented in phase one. And here, a Laparib plus Prexacertib, also two inhibitors, also clinical benefit. Next slide. And in the phase one study of 21 patients, they did see some benefit and they did have proof of principle that they had reduced overall DNA repair. But at the same time, both agents had to be attenuated in dose and or frequency. Next slide, please. So closing, therapeutic DNA damage has led to success in ovarian cancer, but alone it hasn't cured. Inhibiting selective mechanisms of repair to augment injury is now a proven advantage definitely in the preclinical models, and it's starting to smell in the right direction in the patients. So optimizing the approach to maximize benefit and minimize toxicity is our new challenge, especially because most of these agents overlap in their ad adverse side effects, such as marrow toxicity, fatigue, diarrhea, and malaise. And so as we continue to understand the complexity of DNA repair and identify from pictures like the one on the right, the next best target, we'll be able to understand better how to use collaborative therapeutic agents. The next important step is not just to put the agents together, but to understand for whom the benefit is greatest and to develop and, and then employ validated biomarkers beyond simply saying someone is platinum sensitive or has a mutation in a DNA repair gene. So I think we have a tremendous set of opportunities ahead of us, and I think we're set to have even more exponential progress in this decade than we did last. And the next slide, if I'm remembering correctly, is my thank you to everybody. It's a pleasure to represent my institute, but also to share my passion with you for making a difference for patients with ovarian cancer.
Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Elise, for the great talk and uh, an and overview of the opportunities that um, that can arise from um, DNA uh, damage, uh, especially opportunities to um, have effective therapies for uh, women who uh, fail PARP inhibitor therapy. Uh, now, looking at uh, questions, um, we have the first question um, uh, from uh, Elaine. Uh, uh, she asks, the gemcitabine ATR inhibitor trial uh, highlighted the need for biomarkers uh, of replication stress. Uh, what are your thoughts on the development of reliable uh, and accurate biomarkers uh, for replication stress? I think that is an absolutely critical question. And I know that uh, Dr. Constantinopoulos and Dr. Shapiro um, at the Dana-Farber in Boston have some provocative work that they have done. In the study that I showed you, they were able to ascertain biopsies and archival material and blood on patients. And they're in the process of doing a number of correlative studies that I think may help shed some light and hopefully take that first step in developing um, a potential selection biomarker that can be used in the not too distant future. That's great. Um, uh, the next question is from uh, David Botel. Um, uh, thank you, Elise. And uh, related to Elaine's question, what are your thoughts about biomarkers of HRD uh, beyond genomic scarring? Uh, for example, HRD score, uh, such as protein uh, biomarkers? Hi, David. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I must confess, I'm rather frustrated with all the hoopla over HRD because it is a scar. And, and while there have been some suggestions that it maybe changes, it's really not a dynamic measure, which means that if we evaluate it on pre-treated -ther pre tumor and, and our patient is two lines down or three lines down, it's not going to tell us what we need to know. And unfortunately, I think in the coming future, we're going to need to be doing real-time tissue acquisition, even though we all know that's fraught with heterogeneity problems. But at least it will give us some sense of the direction we can go, some of which may ultimately be able to be done in liquid biopsies. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any protein or dynamic genomic markers that we can apply with confidence. I think that there's some under development, and I think that it would be perfect if that's such a thing, if we could in fact do it in blood to save our patients um, the invasive procedure. However, whatever we use has to be able to identify what the, what the problem that we have to target for that patient. So if we find more than one genomic or protein events, then we have to figure out how to select which one is the one to target. And I think that's the second problem. Once we have the biomarkers is to be sure that we're using them in the right way. But I don't think we have them yet, but I know that there are many working on it. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that's all the questions we have at, at, at the moment. Um, just see if there's anything else that comes up. Um, Right. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Elise. We're very, very grateful that you're uh, able to join us uh, at this uh, hour. Um, and um, uh, without further ado, we'll move on to uh, the next speaker. Um, and this is Dr. Elaine uh, Sanji. Uh, she's a cancer biologist and the lab head at St. Vincent's Institute. Uh, she's an honorary senior research fellow at the Peter Mac uh, Cancer Center and a Victorian Cancer Agency mid-career research uh, fellow. And Elaine uh, will give us a talk on the combination of uh, a combination therapy of PARP inhibitors and CX5461 in models of high-grade serous uh, cancer. Over to you, Elaine. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I'll just um, get the slides ready. Thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, for the opportunity to present our work. Um, and uh, as Tarek mentioned, I, um, 
I just joined the St. Vincent Institute as a, a lab head. Uh, but in the last 15 years, I worked at the Peter Mac and I worked as a part of a collaborative program uh, that established targeting polymerase one transcription, RNA polymerase one transcription as a novel cancer therapy. Um, so I, I worked, my initial studies were about understanding uh, transcriptional regulation of ribosomal RNA genes. And they are highly active genes, and this process accounts for 60% of all cellular transcription. Um, and uh, it's a highly active um, process in the cells, and we hypothesize that um, uh, cancer cells will be will be sensitive to targeting this process. And I'm so grateful that Elise has uh, introduced the DNA damage response and replication stress, because I'm, I'm also going to tell you about um, how POL1 transcription interacts with the DNA damage response. Uh, so we we collaborated about 12 years ago with a uh, with a company um, Salim uh, Salim uh, Pharmaceuticals now Senwa Biosciences in the development of CX5461, uh, a first molecule inhibitor of POL1 transcription, um, and I'll be t t telling you more uh, results with CX5461, which uh, entered uh, first in human phase one trial at Pyramac, uh, and we published the data. Uh, in 2019. Uh, so it was in phase one uh, clinical trial in patients with advanced hematological malignancies. And uh, the trial demonstrated uh, that CX5461 is on target in inhibiting POL1 transcription in patient samples. It was well tolerated and it demonstrated single agent anti tumor activity in a third of the trial participants. Uh, and, and the second phase of this trial is continuing at the PIDAMAC. Uh, and uh, at the start of this year, we were uh, awarded uh, a Pfizer Prostate Cancer Foundation Global Challenge Award for funding of a new trial of CX5461 and the PARP inhibitor Tilazoparib in patients with metastatic prostate cancer to start at PIDAMAC uh, this year. Uh, and Shanine Sandu is the clinical lead on this trial. And today I'll be showing you the data that supports the benefit of combining CX5461 with PARP inhibitors. Uh, but before uh, before I get into that, I want to introduce ribosome biogenesis, uh, particularly POL1 transcription, which is a rate limiting step in the process of making the ribosomes. So POL1 transcribes the uh, uh, ribosomal RNA genes within the nucleoli to produce the uh, 47S ribosomal RNA precursor, which is processed to form the 18S, 5.8S, and 28S ribosomal RNAs. These RNAs, together with the 5S uh, ribosomal RNA transcribed by POL3, form the RNA components of the ribosome. And they are assembled with the ribosomal proteins within the nucleoli. Uh, and then uh, the subunits are exported to the cytoplasm to form functional ribosomes. And uh, transcription of uh, POL1 occurs within the nucleoli. And for over 100 years, deregulation of nucleolar structure and function have been associated with poor cancer prognosis. So we, we hypothesize that cancer cells would be more addicted to targeting this process uh, compared to normal cells. Uh, and uh, I just want to give you a, a brief introduction about ribosomal RNA genes. So they, uh, they present in 300 to 600 copies per, uh, per genome, and they organize in clusters on the five acrocentric uh, human chromosomes. Uh, each cluster has about 70 to 80 repeats, and they organized in head to tail fashion and each unit can be, uh, can be transcribed by up to 150 pol one molecules. So they highly transcribe highly repetitive regions, and they are uh, considered one of the more unstable regions in the genome. So these are uh, what, they call, uh, what we call uh, Christmas tree spreads, and they represent how active the each, uh, each uh, ribosomal RNA gene unit, um, and each line represents a pol one molecule transcribing a ribosomal RNA precursor. And in fact, we know that this process is so fragile that it's actually a target of many of the cancer therapeutics that are in the clinic. Uh, so these are, uh, include cisplatin, oxaliplatin, um, camptothecin, the top one and top two inhibitors, and also PAP inhibitors have been shown to inhibit POL1 transcription, um, leading to nucleolar stress. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about nucleolar stress in the next few slides. Uh, 
But our collaboration with, with the Cinema Biosciences was for the development of a compound that specifically targets this process. And, and we predicted that it will have a benefit without the collateral DNA damage that we see with chemotherapeutics. So we've showed that CX5461 is a, a highly selective for pol one over pol two and pol three, uh, that it was selective in killing lymphoma cells in vivo utilizing the immunomic lymphoma model. Uh, and it showed efficacy in preclinical studies against prostate cancer, acute myeloid leukemia, and ovarian cancer. Um, and I, I'm gonna, I'm summarizing a lot of data here. Uh, I just uh, wanna mention that um, we have shown in various models that CX5461 binds to selectivity complex one and prevents pol one uh, recruitment and transcription initiation. Um, we have also shown that it, uh, it uses open chromatin structures at the ribosomal RNA genes, leading to single strand DNA lesions. Uh, and and uh, the, we also detect the presence of R loops, so RNA DNA hybrids. And that leads to replication stress at the ribosomal RNA genes and activation of DNA damage response. Uh, other, other groups have now published that uh, CX5461 can also act as a G4 stabilizer, but we think this can be cell type dependence because we don't see evidence for this, uh, for G4 stabilization in primary cells or in um, on ovarian cancer cells. And, and recently, there have been a couple of publish, uh, publications that showed CX5461 acting as a top two poison. Uh, and and top two A, uh, top isomerase top two A is part of the pre-initiation complex of Pol1, and it's involved. It's important for resolving replication stress and topological stress at the ribosomal RNA genes. So it's possible that CX5461 can can uh, trap Pol2 at the with high selectivity to Pol1 genes um, than the rest of the genome. But we've been focusing on understanding the consequences of inhibiting pol one transcription. And we have shown that it, uh, we, uh, we can activate two uh, independent uh, cellular responses. Uh, one that is a P53 dependent pathway, uh, and it's known now as the classic nucleolar stress response, uh, where, where inhibition of pol one transcription and rRNA synthesis ribosomal RNA synthesis uh, leads to the availability of ribosomal proteins, free ribosomal proteins uh, are uh, RPL11 and uh, 15, uh, 11 and 5, L11 and L5, which can then interact with MDM2 and inhibit MD MDM2 function, leading to P53 stabilization, and that leads to cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. And, and this seems to be a mode of action for some of the chemotherapeutics, as I mentioned earlier, like, like oxaliplatin. Um, uh, the uh, second pathway that we identified is P53 independent pathway, and it involves uh, localized activation of ATM and ATR at the nucleoli. So we see evidence for ATM and activations within the nucleoli, and that leads to global DNA damage response, activation of the cell cycle checkpoints, leading to G2M cell cycle arrest and, and uh, senescence or cell death. Uh, and uh, my research interest going forward in understanding um, how nucleola uh, DNA damage response converts to global replication stress and DNA damage response. Uh, and we, we predicted that CX5461 will have efficacy in ovarian cancer based on the biology of ovarian cancer uh, su subtypes. And that include uh, the, uh, the frequent activation of oncogenic signaling pathways upstream of pol one transcription. So we know that uh, ovarian cancer subtypes have activated um, RAS and uh, RASMAP kinase pathway, also the PI3 kinase pathway is frequently activated in ovarian cancer. And uh, as Elise mentioned in her talk, uh, MYC is uh, frequently amplified in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and these networks coordinate ribosome biogenesis. So we predicted that if we target pol one transcription downstream of these processes, we'll see benefit uh, in ovarian cancer models, and particularly in, in high-grade serous with defects in DNA repair, based on CX5461's ability to activate the DNA damage response. And we published, we published this work last year. Um, so I'm going to show you a bit of the data from the paper we published last year. Uh, and we started by investigating the efficacy of CX5461 across a panel of ovarian cancer cell lines from different histological subtypes. Uh, so we measured growth inhibition 
after uh, two days of treatment. And here we plotted the dose that induced 50% growth inhibition in, in the cell lines. And we identified cell lines that were sensitive to the drug and those that were resistant. And we found that sensitivity to CX5461 did not, uh, was not associated with uh, P53 mutation status, which is important for high-grade serous, where majority of cases um, are, have uh, mutated P53. We, we saw that the sensitive cell lines have higher basal rate of POL1 transcription, so suggesting that higher rate of POL1 transcription sensitize the cells to this drug. And we showed that the drug is on target in the sensitive and the resistant cell lines. So it was capable of uh, inhibiting POL1 transcription to the same extent in the sensitive and the cell line and the, and the resistant cell line cohorts. We then wanted to understand um, uh, and identify sensitivity signatures to CX5461. So we performed gene expression analysis um, of uh, gene expression signatures that were enriched in the uh, sensitive cell lines compared to the resistant cell lines. And we identified MIC targets and also BRCA1 mutated gene signatures to be enriched in the sensitive cell lines. So as I, as I said earlier, MIC is a master regulator of ribosome biogenesis. So it's, it seems that MIC uh, overexpression can sensitize cells to CX5461 and also HR deficiency can sensitize cells to, uh, to CX5461. So we, th we then uh, interrogated this signature in an independent um, cell line cohort from the Broad Institute, and we saw we found that this signature can predict sen uh, sensitivity to CX5461 in another panel. Uh, we then interrogated this signature in, uh, in, a, in uh, ovarian cancer, uh, ovarian cancer samples from the AOCS study, and we identified that uh, a subset of uh, ovarian cancer samples are enriched with this signature in, in primary and relapsed high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And also we uh, can see that uh, a subset of uh, prostate cancer samples, uh, localized and metastatic prostate cancer, um, are enriched with this signature. And we predict that uh, subsets of high-grade serous and prostate cancer uh, to respond to CX5461. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are interested in identifying um, how CX5461 work, how, uh, how it enhances um, the, uh, the mechanisms of action for this drug. And we, we looked at uh, the induction of replication stress uh, at the ribosomal RNA genes um, using co-immunofluorescence for RPA32, S33, which uh, replication protein A um, it binds single-stranded uh, DNA upon uh, replication stress. And we used, we utilized UBF as a nucleolar marker. And as you can see here, upon treatment of CX5461 in OFK8 cells, we can see, uh, 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 we can see a recruitment of RPA to the nucleoli. And this occurs in s phase cells, so in EDU labeled s phase cells, suggesting um, the induction of replication stress is dependent on DNA replication. Uh, we utilize a HR de deficient derivative of OFCA8 cells that we obtained from Clear Scott's lab. Uh, and these cell lines have a knockout of RAT51C, which is important for the HR pathway, and, and that renders them uh, HR deficient. Um, and we have seen that when we treat HR deficient, CX, uh, uh, HR deficient cells with CX5461, we see that um, the nucleola, the nucleola uh, replication stress is dramatically enhanced. Uh, and it uh, occurs in the uh, uh, S phase and non S phase cells. And we also start to see global um, uh, replication stress. We wanted to investigate activation of the DNA damage response, and Elise has introduced uh, ATM and ATR and activation of CHECK1 and CHECK2 kinases. Uh, so here we found that uh, in, in both cell lines, in HR proficient and HR deficient cell lines, CX5461 activates ATR and ATM signaling. Uh, and activates CHECK1 and CHECK2 um, in downstream of ATM and ATR. But we found that the HR deficient cell lines have higher level of uh, CHECK1 phosphorylation and also higher level of uh, RPA phosphorylation on S4, S8. Um, and this replication uh, marker, replication stress marker, marks uh, un uh, destabilized replication fork persistent stalled replication forks. So this suggests that CX5461 uh, 
induces replication stress and, and dramatically in HR deficient cells compared to HR proficient cells. And this occurs in the absence of uh, enhanced induction of uh, gamma H2AX uh, level, which is a marker of double strand DNA break. So it, it induces replication stress, but without enhancing um, DNA damage. We investigated the consequences of uh, CX5461 treatment in knee cells, and we saw that it uh, induces um, proliferation defects in the HR proficient cell lines. So we see uh, 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 pausing of, of uh, proliferation. Uh, however, the HR deficient cells were more sensitive, and we, we see uh, defect in proliferation at the 10 nanomolar level. Uh, when we examined uh, cell death, we saw that the HR deficient cells undergo cell death. However, the uh, HR proficient cells do not uh, do not die, but they 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 do exhibit proliferation defects. We, uh, based on uh, uh, the Western blotting and uh, data showing that CX5461 induces replication stress, we wanted to examine the effects on replication uh, forks. So we utilized this assay, uh, which is called the DNA fiber assay, where the DNA fibers are labeled with two analogs for the same amount of time. And then this labeling is followed by drug treatment. And uh, in HR proficient cells or uh, in cells, in normal cells, the ratio of the two labels, the, the length of the track will be equal, indicating stable forks. Uh, however, uh, a shortening of the second track uh, indicate um, uh, fork delay or and, and stalling of replication forks. And this is what we see with CX5461. So it does cause uh, stalling of DNA replication and, and degradation, uh, which can be reversed with a mirin treatment, with a, which is a MRE11 inhibitor. So when we co-treat the cells with CX5461 and mirin, we rescue um, this, uh, the, the length of the second track, indicating that CX5461 activation of the DDR activate MRE11 activity leading to degradation of replication forks. And since CX5461 acts in a different as a in a different mode of action to PARP inhibitors, we decided to investigate the benefit of combining CX5461 with telazoparib, and we found that the combination leads to enhanced replication stress. So we see here increased activation of uh, RPA uh, phosphorylation on, on S4 and S8, and this was further enhanced in HR deficient cells. So we then wanted to assess uh, the activity of CX5461 in, in patient-derived xenografts in collaboration with Claire Scott at WeHi. Uh, and we utilized uh, a PDX that was mutated for uh, BRCA2, and it was, uh, and, and Claire's lab have shown that it was sensitive to CX5, uh, to sensitive to cisplatin and laprip. Uh, and here, when uh, the tumors were transplanted in mice, we measured um, uh, tumor growth following uh, therapy. And as you can see, this uh, PDX responds to elaprib as a single agent, so we're inhibiting tumor growth. Uh, and, and CX5461 demonstrated single agent efficacy against this PDX. And the combination of CX5461 and PAPI led to tumor regression that was maintained during, um, during the treatment period. Uh, and it led to significant enhancement in uh, survival of the tumor-bearing mice. We, we next investigated the efficacy of CX5461 in a PDX that was resistant to cisplatin and elaprib. Uh, and as you can see here, this PDX did not respond to elaprib as a single agent. Uh, it did respond to CX5461 as a single agent, which uh, stopped tumor growth and uh, led to enhanced survival uh, of the tumor-bearing mice. However, the combination here of CX5461 and, and and PAPI did not lead to further enhancement of replication uh, of uh, tumor growth. Was, uh, so the next question for us was uh, to understand the mechanism of resistance in this PDX. Um, and uh, we utilized this assay, which was uh, uh, developed in Alan, uh, Professor Alan DeAndre's lab, who will be talking in, in session four of this symposium. Uh, so his, his um, group has shown that a functional assay of replication stress utilizing, utilizing the replication um, the, uh, fiber assays can predict sensitivity to chemotherapy and uh, DDR inhibitors. So in this assay, the, the DNA fibers are labeled with the two analogs, as I mentioned earlier, and a shortening of the second track indicate unstable forks, 
and uh, these uh, cells with uh, an organoid in this in this paper with unstable forks, uh, they responded to carboplatin, uh, uh, check one and ATR inhibitors. Uh, however, organoids that exhibited uh, stable forks, where the second track is the same length as the first track, upon treatment with hydroxyurea, um, uh, 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 can predict re uh, resistance to uh, cisplat uh, to carboplatin and ATR and, and check one inhibitors. So we utilize this assay in a, uh, in a cell line we, um, uh, that was derived from uh, the PDX I showed you earlier that was established in, 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 in Claire's lab. And we have shown that uh, utilizing the DNA fiber assay, that upon treatment with hydroxyurea, we detect stable forks. Uh, so this is a, a ratio of one, indicating that the forks are stable in this cell line. However, when we treated the cells with CX5461, we saw a decrease in the second track, indicating a destabilization of replication forks. So CX5461 can overcome fork protection uh, in, in these PAPI and cisplatin resistance cell lines. Uh, and this is important because fork protection is a common mechanism of resistance to chemotherapy. Uh, and here we showed that the combination of hydroxyurea and CX5461 can further enhance fork destabilization. Uh, we showed that in, in this cell line, CX5461 activates ATR at the nucleoli, marked here by UBF, and it led to a defect in proliferation uh, in vitro uh, that was associated mainly with the G2M cell cycle arrest. So we propose that CX5461 is an exciting treatment option for patients with relapsed uh, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and we're actively seeking funding to, uh, for a new trial of CX5461 uh, alone and in combination with PAP inhibitors in ovarian cancer. Um, so uh, we also published this work, it's ac oh, not published yet, sorry, it's accepted. So hopefully it'll come out soon, where we showed that CX5461 uh, and the combination with telazoparib uh, inhibited tumor growth of HR proficient PDXs of uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer. And this work was done in collaboration with Gail Risbridger and Luke Ferex Group uh, at the Peter Mac. And, uh, and that was the basis for, for then um, the funding uh, of Pfizer and Prostate Cancer Foundation to uh, start a new trial of CX5461 and PAPI in, in prostate cancer. Um, we uh, also wanted to understand. Um, interactions, uh, synthetic lethal interactions of CX5461, and identify ways to improve this therapy in HR proficient cells. So we performed the whole genome RNAi screen to identify genes whose knockdown would cooperate with CX5461 in inhibiting OFCA4 cell growth. So we performed this assay, uh, at, uh, this screen at the VCFG at the Peter Mac. Um, and we uh, so the um, we knocked down every uh, coding uh, protein coding gene in the genome, and we uh, uh, we performed a treatment with a GI GI20 of a GI20 of CX5461, and then we looked at cell survival after 48 hours of treatment, and we looked at synthetic lethal interactions, and we identified uh, 370 genes in the primer screens in the primary screen that interacted with CX5461. And of those, 41 genes uh, controlled different DNA repair pathways. So CX5461 has strong interactions with the DNA uh, repair and DNA damage response. And we validated uh, uh, synthetic lethal interactions with the HR genes. Uh, and also TOP1 um, was one of our top hits, TOP isomerase 1. Uh, which is um, uh, important for resolving topological stress and replication stress. Uh, we did a lot of work to show synergy, uh, that we, we showed synergy of CX5461 and topotecan in um, uh, top one inhibitor in HR proficient high-grade serous ovarian cancer cell lines. And here we performed uh, an in vivo assay um, against OFCA3 uh, xenografts. Uh, and we utilized topotecan at one-fifth of the maximum tolerated dose, and we showed that the combination of CX5461 with low dose of topotecan was um, led to survival benefits and improve, improved survival of the tumor-bearing mice. And this is important because here we're utilizing topotecan at a low dose. Uh, topotecan used in the clinic uh, is hindered by its cytotoxicity, so perhaps the combination of CX5461 and topotecan can enhance um, the utility of topotecan in the clinic. 
Uh, I just want to highlight here that when uh, the mechanism of action for this combination, that when we combine CX5461 with low dose of topotecan, we enhance the DNA damage response at the nucleoli, so specifically at the nucleoli. Uh, and this is in comparison with doxorubicin, uh, a chemotherapeutic where that induces uh, global DNA damage. Uh, and when we perform DNA damage assay at the single, uh, single cellular level using uh, comet assays, we see that the combination of uh, CX5461 and topotecan does not enhance uh, DNA damage by comparison to doxorubicin as a single agent. Um, so this, uh, we propose that this combination will be effective in inhibiting tumor growth without the collateral DNA damage uh, that is associated with chemotherapy. Finally, this is the last data slide. We performed uh, a boutique CRISPR-Cas9 screen to confirm synthetic lethal interactions of CX5461 with DNA repair genes. And we knocked out different uh, DNA repair genes from the HR pathway, the NHEJ and, and nucleotide excision repair, uh, and also the DNA damage response. And we can see strong interaction uh, and, and growth inhibition of CX5461 when we knock, knock out these genes. Um, and so it uh, interacts with most of the DNA, with these DNA repairs, DNA repair pathways, with a, with a, uh, with a different sensitivity profile compared to the uh, uh, therapeutics we tested, cisplatin, uh, top one and top two inhibitors, and also uh, ATR and check one uh, inhibitors. So it has a, a distinct sensitivity profile compared to uh, uh, the chemotherapeutics that are utilized in the clinic. And we are interested in, uh, up, uh, in identifying optimal combination therapies with these, with these compounds. So as a summary, uh, I uh, showed you today that targeting ribosomal RNA genes is a new approach to cancer therapy. CX5461 induces uh, targeted activation of uh, DNA damage response at the nucleoli and exhibits therapeutic efficacy in preclinical models of ovarian cancer. Uh, and that CX5461 demonstrates synthetic lethality with DNA repair pathways in high grade serious ovarian cancer models. Uh, so our research going forward is focused on identifying and, and characterizing the cellular and molecular response to CX5461 and to understand the mechanisms of sensitivity and resistance. And we are keen to identify and validate optimal combination therapies to improve the outcome of patients with ovarian and prostate cancer. And uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm interested in mechanistic studies as well. So my uh, research group at St. Vincent Institute is interested in understanding and characterizing the nucleola DNA damage response and understanding how nucleolar DNA damage response leads to global replication stress. Because we believe that better understanding of nucleolar DNA damage response will uncover novel pathways to induce replication stress, and that will have, this will have immense implications for anti-cancer therapies. So finally, it's my acknowledgement slide. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my team at St. Vincent Institute, particularly Anthony Juan, who's a PhD student that's performing the mechanistic studies of the nucleolar DNA damage response. Uh, I'd like to thank my old, ta uh, my old lab at Peter Mac uh, and my mentor, Rick Pearson. Uh, and Keith Chan has uh, co-supervised um, uh, with Rick and myself, uh, Shen Fei Yan, during his PhD studies, where uh, he performed the uh, synthetic lethal screen of CX5461, which I've shown you today. And I would also like to thank our clinical collaborators and our scientific collaborators, uh, particularly Claire Scott for the use of uh, her um, PDX uh, and cell lines for the assessment of CX5461 efficacy in ovarian cancer. Um, and I would also like to thank our fund the funding agencies. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elaine. A fascinating uh, talk. Um, very exciting opportunities uh, to, to try and, find, I guess, find uh, better uh, combination therapies. A um, couple of questions. Uh, first from uh, Elise Cohn. Uh, Elaine, fascinating work with a greater susceptibility in replication stress adapted cells. Uh, what happens if you add r, &R inhibition, such as gemcitabine? Have you tried that? We haven't. This is something I'm really keen on trying and understanding the um, the effects on fo replication folk stability. So that's the, the next important thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Um, and a question from the Dale uh, Garza. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Uh, given the MIG signaling pathway was upregulated in sensitive cells, does MIG amplification status correlate with sensitivity to CX5461? 
And if so, is this independent of HRD status? That, that's a great question, uh, Dale. So we incorporating that in the, in the trial in prostate cancer, looking at uh, MIC amplification and whether that would um, correlate with sensitivity to CX5461. Um, so when uh, we, we know with most of the preclinical studies we've, we've used and the models we've used, uh, they are MIC driven. So we think we think MIC sensitizes cells to CX5461. Uh, when we um, when we when we um, when we identified the signature in ovarian cancer cell lines, we tried to apply the signature of MIC uh, independently of the HR signature, HRD signature, and actually it, there was more power in applying both of them together. So I think I think we need both signatures. Um, and and you know MIC amplification MIC can also induces replication the threshold level of the induction of replication stress with MIC and HRD that sensitizes cells to CX5461. Uh, uh, thanks, Elaine. Um, I guess a question from, from me. So as, as you may know, there's a lot of uh, interest and ongoing studies looking at combining um, uh, PARP inhibitors with uh, immunotherapy uh, based on the preclinical scientific rationale for that, that um, PARP inhibitors or, or harnessing sort of DNA damage that can lead to um, um, error-prone repair and new antigen uh, generation, more interferon gamma production, etc. So it's always interesting to see, you know, whether these uh, additional combinations will, how will they contribute to the, I guess, the immunogenicity um, uh, and sensitivity of these cells to, to potentially immune activating agents or immune targeting yeah. agents. Yeah. So we, we're doing this study, we've, we've um, established the ID8 model from Ian McNeish, we've, we've got it here, and we want to do the, these studies to investigate the combinations with uh, immunotherapies. We know that CX5461 treatment similar to PARPI induces, uh, uh, induces micro, um, micronuclei, so genomic instability that can then uh, activate the stink pathway leading to pro-inflammatory responses. So we want to do these combinations in the ID8 model and perhaps also uh, combine combine with sting agonists and NTPD1 to see uh, whether we can enhance efficacy. We know in, in, in syngeneic models that we see better, um, better efficacy of the drug in syngeneic models compared to uh, nude mice. So we know that the immune system plays a part in this therapy. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from uh, from Elise. Um, can you touch on why HRD signature uh, may be important, uh, but you're seeing single agent activity uh, in the uh, platinum uh, and PARP inhibitor resistant cells, um, as this seems to be a contradiction? Um, I, I think HRD, when we look at the HRD cells, we see a more uh, robust activation of the D DNA damage response and replication stress. I think maybe uh, CX5461 in its ability to destabilize the fork interacts with HRD loss in further destabilizing the fork, leading to uh, enhanced replication stress. And then when when MIC, in cells that over uh, overexpressing MIC, there's an enhancement of that replication stress. So I think it's a threshold level, uh, but we need more mechanistic work to understand the, the contribution of each pathway. Uh, okay, I don't see any more uh, questions coming up. Um, so I think we might close the session with this, Elaine. Thank you so much uh, for the presenting talk. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to, to these studies sort of transferring over to uh, gynecological cancers as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so um, uh, the, the, the next speaker is, uh, is myself. I'm a medical oncologist from, uh, from uh, Perth, WA. Uh, hopefully you can see my uh, uh, slides at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm giving mainly a clinical overview on uh, immunotherapy and ovarian cancer, uh, uh, 
clinical trials mainly uh, to date, ongoing studies and some of the uh, uh, future uh, uh, directions and, and studies in development. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. Uh, so for, for a very long time, we've we've known that there's a, a prognostic uh, role uh, for um, uh, T-cell infiltration into tumor T-cells in ovarian cancer uh, with uh, uh, tumors at baseline uh, that have uh, high intertumor T-cells having uh, much better uh, uh, overall survival than those without intertumor T-cells. So we know that uh, as a prognostic rather than predictive marker, uh, uh, T-cell infiltration uh, is important. Uh, and this is one of the earlier studies of anti-PD-1 uh, checkpoint inhibition in, in uh, ovarian cancer, small study, uh, looking at nivolumab at uh, two different dose levels. Uh, and although response rate was only uh, 15%, I think, on this study, uh, the important thing is what we also see uh, in other uh, tumor types where immunotherapy uh, is effective. When it works, uh, that durability of response is what uh, makes uh, immunotherapy um, uh, such a, 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 a promising or hopeful uh, 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 treatment option in uh, in many cancers, including ovarian cancer, uh, because unlike a lot of the targeted therapies that we've had to date, um, uh, where ultimately resistance develops to, to in most patients, uh, durable responses to immunotherapy can can be long lasting. Uh, in recurrent ovarian cancer, the uh, single agent activity. Uh, to immunotherapy has been quite modest, uh, single digit or low double digits, the 10 to 20% uh, response rate. Um, more recent studies looking at combinations such as the uh, um, uh, anti PD1 pembrolizumab with paclitaxel, uh, again in a small phase two study, uh, had a higher response rate of up to 51%, uh, as well as combination immunotherapy versus single agent immunotherapy. Uh, uh, in phase two study uh, also demonstrating uh, a higher response. So both of these approaches uh, are being taken to uh, uh, larger studies, including I think a study in development for the um, um, pembrolizumab paclitaxel combo. Um, but that all uh, brought the, the, the same sort of approach that we've had in a number of other cancers, all the excitement of moving treatments from uh, second and subsequent line treatment to uh, earlier. Uh, line. So in first line setting, um, there's been a lot of excitement. There's been a number of studies, including probably up to 5,000 patients uh, in the first line setting, trying to combine immunotherapy with uh, chemotherapy. Uh, two of these studies uh, have uh, uh, reported, and both were negative uh, for their primary endpoint. Um, so Javelin 100, and randomized uh, women uh, with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer to uh, chemotherapy. Uh, either with um, uh, evalumab uh, followed by maintenance evalumab or just followed by maintenance evalumab. And for both uh, comparisons with chemotherapy alone, uh, the hazard ratio, which was, which was not significant, uh, uh, was 1.43 and 1.14 respectively. This was presented at SGO uh, last year. Um, and the second study, which was uh, 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 published uh, a couple of months ago in the JCO uh, was the Imagine uh, uh, 50 study, which combined uh, carboplatin paclitaxel BEV uh, with etizolizumab, uh, PDL1 inhibitor. Uh, and again, there was no significant um, uh, benefit from adding the chemotherapy in these uh, unselected uh, newly diagnosed uh, uh, patients, uh, most of whom uh, have had primary debulking. I think the uh, proportion of women who had new adjunct chemotherapy on that study was about 25%. Um, um, and on, they have not yet reported, um, reported, I think, PDL1, but not uh, other biomarkers that are looking at, uh, uh, including HRD and, uh, uh, and bracket, and other hopefully translation research, which will be important uh, to maybe uh, try and work out uh, subsets of patients uh, that respond, because clearly from uh, studies in recurrence, the, there are women that do benefit, um, but I think doing this in unselected patients uh, up front with single agent treatment at least um, uh, uh, has so far uh, been disappointing. So there are at least four ongoing studies. Um, uh, Looking with the same approach, uh, except that uh, uh, these now have uh, additional uh, agents. So most of these studies uh, also have uh, a BEV or two have BEV, but the others have single agent um, 
uh, PD-1 inhibitor uh, as well as a PARP inhibitor. And we've had, we have, I think, at least two of these studies, the uh, um, ANGO-46 uh, Gilink uh, 1 and I think the OVAR-43 um, in Australia. Uh, and so these are ongoing studies that we'll look forward to their results. Uh, and Athena, actually, as well, we do have. Um, so this is the first line sort of ongoing uh, studies and reported studies. Uh, recently, I uh, presented at ASCO uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've just picked three uh, studies looking at immune-directed uh, approaches uh, to give you just a, a, a top-line uh, uh, update on. Uh, so this dendritic cell vaccine uh, uh, study was uh, previously reported. Uh, this is combining with chemotherapy uh, either in parallel uh, or uh, sequential. So this is a dendritic cell vaccine, um, um, which is tumor-derived. Um, and uh, this was a biomarker exploratory analysis uh, of the phase two uh, study. So it was 100 patients randomized one uh, to one to one. Uh, to either standard of care, platinum-based chemotherapy, uh, either with uh, the vaccine or sequential uh, with the vaccine, um, with a primary endpoint being PFS uh, two years after randomization, uh, and also secondary and exploratory endpoints uh, looking at predictive and prognostic uh, uh, biomarkers and other uh, clinical uh, endpoints. Uh, so the final analysis had shown um, uh, uh, a small, again, in a small study, uh, uh, a, a potential advantage for the sequential uh, arm when compared to the standard of care. Uh, so 30 patients uh, only in each arm, but the hazard ratio was uh, 0.39 with a p-value of 0.033. Uh, uh, six uh, favoring the sequential uh, DC vaccine, and the overall survival uh, was not significant uh, uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.4. Uh, comparing sequential to standard of care. Uh, so there was a significant PFS, uh, but not OS. Uh, uh, and the update uh, uh, in this report was looking at um, CD8 uh, positive T cells um, uh, uh, with a threshold of 30 CD8 positive T cells per millimeter squared. Uh, I don't think they described in the presentation uh, how the threshold was uh, determined, but presumably uh, this is still a, a data-driven uh, cutoff, but, but I don't think that was made clear. Uh, so essentially, it looked at those with uh, low CD8 positive T cells um, uh, and looked at the same uh, outcomes, comparing uh, the DC uh, uh, vaccine to standard of care. Uh, and um, for those with low CD8 uh, uh, T cells, there's a significant difference um, uh, with a hazard ratio of uh, 0 0.15 uh, and uh, p-value of 0 0.0038. Um, and uh, with those patients that had high CD8 positive T cell levels, uh, there's no significant difference uh, between the DC uh, vaccine and standard of care, suggesting that uh, it is really those that didn't have um, uh, uh, a good detail infiltration of baseline that got the benefit from uh, the vaccine, which uh, which sort of makes sense um, uh, biologically. Uh, so the authors concluded that the combination uh, may be beneficial in optimally both women, prolonging PFS uh, 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 only a significant case. OS was not significant to point out. But the exploratory analysis showed that uh, CD8 T cells could be a potential uh, predictive uh, biomarker uh, with a significant reduction um, um, in, in death for those with a low CD8 positive T cell count uh, at four years, uh, being 17%, uh, 14% in the two uh, DC vaccine arms and 71% in standard of care. Uh, so this might uh, be used for selecting patients who might benefit from this uh, uh, application, and hopefully we'll see more uh, 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 studies uh, uh, with this potentially selected, uh, a biomarker selected uh, approach. Um, and and from a toxicity perspective, it was it was safe and well tolerated. Uh, the second study was also uh, an update on a previously uh, uh, presented uh, result uh, for vigil immunotherapy in newly diagnosed women, uh, looking at the subset of patients uh, who are homologous repair are proficient, and they use the uh, myriad um, HRD assay. Uh, so the primary endpoint for uh, uh, 
the, the uh, full population was not met. This compares uh, this uh, autologous uh, tumor-derived uh, 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 vaccine um, uh, to placebo, uh, and there is no difference in recurrence-free survival uh, with a hazard ratio um, uh, of um, 0.69. That was not statistically significant. Um, and the subgroup of patients who uh, were homologous repair proficient, uh, the uh, relapse-free survival from randomization favored uh, uh, the GEM uh, arm with uh, hazard ratio of 0.386 and a p-value of 0 0.007, um, with a clinically meaningful difference uh, in PFS 10.6 compared to 5.7. Uh, and similarly, for overall survival, uh, the hazard ratio is 0 0.34, uh, 0 0.019. So this is obviously exploratory and hypothesis generating, uh, and they did not uh, uh, go into great uh, detail uh, on uh, any uh, additional translational work that might try and explain uh, this finding. But again, it might be uh, that those with uh, homologous repair proficient uh, disease benefited more from the vaccine because they had less uh, antigen presentation and the antigen load um, uh, that might be seen with the HR uh, 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 deficient patients. So um, the authors concluded that the upfront maintenance with the uh, GEM um, was uh, uh, tolerable. It did not meet the primary endpoint uh, of RFS in all patients, um, but for the homologous repair proficient group, uh, there was um, uh, a benefit in recurrence-free and overall survival uh, at two years, 92 versus 55, and at three years, 70 uh, versus 40% overall, overall survival. Um, and uh, uh, you know, ongoing um, uh, 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 reports on the translation studies will, will hopefully inform as well um, uh, patient selection. Uh, the third and last study uh, that was uh, that I selected was a, a new adjuvant um, study looking at uh, pembrolizumab with chemotherapy uh, as new adjuvant treatment of ovarian cancer, uh, giving four cycles before and after surgery uh, with or without uh, pembrolizumab. Um, and the primary endpoint was complete resection rate at, uh, at IDS. Uh, so this was, was random, randomization two to one. Uh, four cycles and an interval debulking with lots of uh, correlative, um, hopefully, uh, data to come from the German liquid biopsies, which were mandatory uh, at interval debulking and at baseline, uh, but optional at progression. Uh, and really, the uh, uh, key point here um, was the, the statistical analysis on this the design was. Uh, uh, Met because it, it wasn't a non it was a non comparative phase two studies. So the rate of complete debulking was seventy three point eight percent in the uh, intervention arm, uh, but it was also unexpectedly high or or high also in the uh, control arm. So it was not a, a big difference between these two, uh, cer certainly numerically. Um, they pointed out the response rate after four cycles by resist. Uh, was greater in the um, uh, RMB, which is again a secondary endpoint. But again, we all know uh, there are significant limitations for um, uh, radiological response uh, in ovarian cancer that doesn't seem to uh, correlate with uh, with PFS or OS. We know that from uh, from from other studies. Um, so, you know, interesting, but certainly not uh, a, a groundbreaking um, uh, result. So um, all studies reported to date, or both studies reported to date, have looked at single agent uh, immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy, but there are a number of ongoing trials that are looking at uh, combination uh, immunotherapy, doublet immunotherapy uh, with CTLA-4 and PD-1 or PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, uh, so three of these, uh, all investigator initiated studies. Uh, I-Prime will be known to uh, 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 many of you, which is an Australian ANSCOG study. Uh, looking at new adjuvant treatment with chemotherapy, uh, plus or minus um, dervalumab and tremolimumab with randomization of two to one, uh, interval debulking and the primary endpoint being the complete response rate, a pathological response rate, uh, followed by adjuvant treatment with the same regimen and maintenance uh, treatment for the immunotherapy arm uh, uh, up to an additional uh, 36 weeks. 
the second study uh, is um, uh, from uh, the Korean Gynecological Oncology Group, uh, also looking at Durvalumab and uh, Tremolimumab. Um, and they had two cohorts, an expansion cohort uh, that recently uh, uh, commenced. Uh, the original cohort had uh, trimalumab pre-op only and trimalumab post-op, uh, and the uh, expansion cohort has a single larger dose of trimalumab uh, up front uh, with maintenance trimalumab uh, uh, after surgery. Uh, and again, uh, this uh, study also has uh, biopsies, its diagnosis and interval debulking, obviously, uh, as well as uh, optional progression. Um, and the third study is from uh, uh, Coneco, um, and this is predominantly adjuvant only. Uh, and then after interview debulking, I believe they continue with chemotherapy alone. And that looks at uh, uh, starting immunotherapy from the second cycle uh, with Dervalumab and Tremolumab. So these are all three are, are small studies, uh, but hopefully uh, might shed some light on whether increasing um, um, the intensity, I guess, of immune uh, checkpoint inhibition with uh, two drugs uh, may provide uh, an additional advantage, uh, but probably more importantly, uh, uh, especially given the negative data from the single agent studies, the uh, correlation with uh, PBMCs on most of these studies, ctDNA and uh, uh, mandatory uh, uh, tissue biopsies and planned translation research. And there's been discussion with these other two uh, groups about potentially, uh, you know, pooling resources and, and, and data to try and better understand uh, uh, patient selection uh, for these treatments. Um, so, yeah, sorry, this is just the addition. If, if, if women are unresectable, they do uh, are able to continue with, uh, with more uh, treatment followed by debulking. But, so, I mean, this is an old slide, but there's a, a lot of barriers to effective immunotherapy, and we, we're yet to understand these. Um, and some of the new approaches, such as uh, uh, VEGF inhibition, which still hasn't provided an advantage to imagine, uh, but also PARP inhibition uh, might uh, try and uh, 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 circumvent some of the limitations of um, uh, single agent treatment. Um, as uh, uh, I asked Elaine and alluded by Elaine, we, we still need to better understand the uh, immune consequences of uh, 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 inhibiting or causing um, uh, increased tumor load in the antigen, as well as activating the stink pathway with, uh, with PARP inhibitors and, and potentially other drugs that target that pathway. Um, so really, it all comes back to the immune cycle. And um, uh, if we are going to achieve these effective tumor infiltrating such toxic T cells, uh, then you know all steps of the immune cycle will need to uh, be able to progress, and perhaps this is what's not happening at the moment. Whether uh, uh, insufficient new antigen or antigen are presented, uh, and therefore the repertoire of T cells generated is, is is not sufficient to generate a response, um, uh, whereas the, the activation or inhibition at the tumor level or T cell exclusion that are causing uh, these drugs are not to work, and which of these aspects, whether it's vaccines, a dual immunotherapy, uh, a checkpoint inhibition at different points, uh, or a combination with uh, targeted uh, therapies, or even uh, new uh, checkpoint um, uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors targeting other uh, pathways, such as LAC3 and TIM3 and others. Um, there's a lot of work uh, uh, to do, and hopefully the ongoing studies, the, the great excitement with 5,000 you know, patients on first-line studies with very, with probably not enough um, uh, uh, pre-existing data to, to, to generate that interest, just really the promise from all the other uh, advanced other tumor types, uh, and really even in gynecological cancers, um, we continue to see uh, good advances um, in uh, uh, cervical cancer and uterine cancer, both MMR proficient and deficient uh, for immunotherapy, but um, in ovarian cancer, it's unfortunately not ready for prime time, but but hopefully any minute now um, for the hopefuls. Uh, ongoing combination studies, whether it's PARP inhibitors, as I said, uh, dual immunotherapies or novel checkpoint inhibitors, uh, uh, targets with other uh, uh, targeted therapies, um, and, but most importantly, a better understanding uh, of uh, patient selection and the development, identification, um, 
of uh, predictive biomarkers uh, uh, to better stratify patients for uh, who will need what treatment approach. Uh, there have been great advances in ovarian cancer in recent years, and uh, hopefully immunotherapy will join that landscape uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, thank you. Um, so a question from uh, Elise, what are your thoughts about the outlier patients who did well with IO? Uh, do you think we should be testing TMB and or MSI status across the board? Uh, all uh, histotypes in ovarian cancer? Um, I think we, we clearly don't know. Um, uh, even PDL1 is, 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 is one biomarker that has been shown to maybe be a little bit more uh, predictive of response to inhibition of PD1, PDL1 pathway. Uh, but as it has been shown in melanoma, it is you know, only partially predictive and probably not enough to exclude those patients that will do well. Um, TMB and MSI status, I mean, I, I think better understanding and certainly TMB and MSI status is being increasingly done. Uh, I think in our institution, we're often doing um, um, MMR, uh, IHC on, on, on most women with, with newly diagnosed uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, TMB is not as um, um, uh, obviously widely available, but certainly as part of um, uh, the ongoing uh, studies. I think the biomarker uh, collection translation samples that we're collecting are certainly uh, planned to uh, look at uh, TMB and MSI status uh, amongst other uh, Aspect. So I think it will be important, but again, whether that is is enough, is it going to be the tumor, the total mutational burden, or is that is is that going to still be representative of the new antigen repertoire that's required to generate uh, tumor specific T cells? Um, we still uh, don't know. So we're uh, open for um, uh, questions, um, and I don't know if this is uh, allowed, but um, I think Elise and Elaine are both still on. So if you have a question for any of the three of us, um, we are well ahead of time. Uh, so happy to, to, to share these. Oh, thank you, Elaine, for talking back in. <laughs> so Tarek, what are your thoughts on uh, CAR T cell therapy and the potential for CAR T cell in, in other I mean, I, I think we have a couple, been a couple of proposals in uh, in Australia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just haven't seen any 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 solid data uh, yet. But we again, it's just one of the uh, immune armamentarium approaches that we 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 have. Again, can we generate uh, CAR T cells that sort of are still capturing the the, the enough? Of that heterogeneity, I mean, maybe it's the heterogeneity that that's that's part of the problem as well, mm -hmm. uh, and whether CAR tissue generation can still encompass all that to 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 not just lead to you know partial uh, response, which maybe is hidden in a lot of these women where where there are T cells being generated, um, but they're just not uh, not broad enough uh, uh, to to capture the heterogeneity. Yeah. Is there a question from Elise? I'll ask you the question. What, what target do you think might be the most useful for CAR T? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, yeah, Mark 1, CR25. Um, I, 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 I don't really know. I mean, I, I don't think there's enough, uh, you know, single um, uh, uh, target to, to, to I think would be beneficial. Yeah, I don't know. I can answer that question. A long way to learn about, you know, biomarkers and immunotherapy. I think we're we've, uh, we're way ahead with uh, uh, patient recruitment and treatment uh, ahead of uh, biomarker understanding. Um, uh, but maybe all these patients that are enrolled and hopefully lots of samples available will help us uh, uh, understand, especially if we've got sequential uh, uh, biopsies, pre and post treatment. So I think new adjuvant studies are. Beneficial, and that's why you know we've, we've designed I promise new adjuvant study to, to ensure that we have uh, pre and post treatment uh, tissue on, on, on all women. Um, but the, the published studies also uh, have good proportion of new adjuvant uh, patients. So so we'll see. Um, 
Uh, David Botel is adding a, a comment. Um, we are strong believers in analysis of rare exceptional responders, including on trials. Uh, but unless the trial is purely I.O., uh, no chemotherapy or targeted, uh, or, or targeted agent, can you find exceptional uh, cases? Um, well, I mean, obviously there are single agent studies, but now they're, they're dwindling because with the, with the single agent activity being quite low from the earlier studies, um, uh, almost everything now is, is in combination. Um, so uh, the, the, there's a, you know, several hundred patients in, in previous uh, studies, but I haven't seen any new study with single agent treatment, except I guess for, uh, for combination immunotherapy. There are still uh, studies in recurrence that are looking at ipilimumab and nivolumab uh, combination only without the chemotherapy target agent. So maybe uh, these will, will give that cord. And a uh, message uh, comment from at least some of the exceptional responders, example, clear cell, uh, have turned out to be the subset who are MSI. Here is another setting where, as you indicated, we really need, um, sorry, message from me. Uh, need viable uh, and reliable biomarkers. Yes, that's true. I mean, clear cell is, is, is one of the uh, subtypes that has been shown to, to, to put it, and there, there are at least two or three studies that are looking at purely at, uh, at clear cell ovarian cancer, uh, and, and because they've been shown to potentially be a subset that has a, has a greater response. Um, for GY03, yes, there was 33 response rate for Epinevo, but the PFS was only 3.9 months. Yes, that is that is true. But we know that PFS in, uh, in immunotherapy from other tumor types as well, it does tend to sort of fall off. It's really, again, those responders that can respond for a long period of time. So PFS can be deceiving as a median um, uh, because the, the, if, if the 33% responders have, have really durable responses, then that's what made you know, other treatments like ipilimumab in melanoma with a response rate of 10 to 15% uh, uh, gain, gain approval with, again, a PFS that would have been three or four months. Uh, okay, what have we got here? Uh, a question uh, from David and, and Elise. Um, David, post PD1 and uh, PDL and CTLA4, there has been little, nothing new. Have have we hit an uh, immunotherapy wall? Well, we're st we're really struggling with a wall. I mean, it, 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 we haven't made much progress to hit a wall. We're actually starting from a wall, but um, uh, no, well, that's not quite. I mean, it, in in ovarian cancer, we don't we haven't looked at post PD1, PDL1, CTLA4 because there's there's no patients, you know, there's no big cores that responded are now needing subsequent therapy, but certainly in, in other tumor types, um, post PD-1, PD-1, CDNA-4, it's been the other novel checkpoint inhibitors. So, um, uh, lag three melanoma has been shown to be upregulated, uh, as patients acquire resistance to PDL one and, uh, there's good phase two data for, uh, response to, uh, lag three overexpression after PDL1 failure, um, and recently, you know, the first non-CTLA4 combo to show benefit uh, in melanoma has been uh, 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 PD1 and LAG3. Um, so it's going to be, you know, biomarkers who responds and what happens uh, at time of progression to then work out what. Uh, maybe it is some of these other immune checkpoint combinations that. We do need uh, to explore, and they're being explored in even early phase stage one B studies that have P1 backbone and novel um, uh, 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 targets, and many of them include ovarian cancer uh, and subsets. There's a question from Anna DeFazio: Where do you think the greatest potential is? Is that we don't yet know what the checkpoints are in ovarian cancer? Uh, Yes, that's definitely one of the problems, uh, is not knowing the checkpoints, the heterogeneity, the, uh, the, the I guess the, the time and whether things change from uh, upfront to platinum sensitive, platinum resistant disease, the difference between HR uh, uh, deficient and proficient uh, uh, patients, uh, the difference between women that do have that uh, neantrogen load and, and um, 
and 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 stress from DNA damage uh, 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 defects uh, compared to those that don't. So, uh, I mean, even in other tumor types where uh, immunotherapy is effective, it, it's not it's not really identifying the checkpoint that has been uh, uh, clear. Other than lag three, um, PDL one expression is sort of variable in its um, its utility across different tumor types. It, it tends to be dynamic. You know, when you have uh, chemotherapy that causes cell death, they actually get upregulation of PDL1. So just different different time points, PDL1 can, can change as well. Um, um, trying to see what else. I think there was a new comment from Elise, right? Um, about the median ah, yes thank you um, and thanks a lot i agree uh, from elise i agree that median pfs can be deceiving but we cannot approve agents for exceptional responders or we cannot select for those patients where therefore treating all to find a few uh toxicity risk doesn't doesn't continue but but yes no, I, I absolutely agree uh, I, i'm not saying that this is sufficient to uh to be uh beneficial i guess what has what has led to some of these being approved is an OS advantage. So, uh, so you, you, you sometimes get a, a PFS that's not significant, but subsequently uh, OS uh, 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 has been significant in some of the melanoma studies. So, yes, without OS data, then you know, then then we can't just go on response rate completely agree. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that will cover everything on here. Yeah, I mean, I, I remain hopeful that that it, it there's incredible you know efforts in the in the targeted uh, uh, therapy. Uh, approach, but almost all of these are, are also described with uh, you know emerging resistance and how res resistance develops. Um, so it's really whether we can capture that window, understand which patients you can just use that um, you know durable long-term immune memory, uh, and generate it in that window where you're get, getting a benefit from a targeted uh, therapy. This is just a you know a very you know, general hope is that this. This might be, but that's been disappointing in other cancers, and again in uh, in melanoma. Uh, and, yeah, and resistance uh, to therapy. Yeah, BRF inhibition with PD one inhibitors was was supposed to be amazing, and it's just maybe mar maybe marginally better. Um, so that 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 is a hope, but what, how it will translate, uh, only just uh, time will tell. Okay, well, I think maybe we will draw the meeting to a close and, and give everyone an extra uh, 19 minutes. Uh, thank you so much uh, for both uh, Elise and Elaine for giving up uh, their time. It is well and truly later now for you, uh, Elise. We're grateful that you still stayed on uh, for the rest of the, of the meeting and for your, your very valuable input. Uh, uh, thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you to, again to uh, Varian Cancer Australia and AstraZeneca for supporting this. Uh, for everyone who uh, joined us this morning, evening, afternoon um, uh, of, of discussion, we look forward to uh, seeing you in the next sessions. And most importantly, we look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, your trip to Australia, at least this time, has been very, very brief and um, you know, with very little sightseeing. So hopefully next time you'll uh, you'll, you'll we'll get to, uh, to to meet in person. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'll draw the meeting to a close. And uh, please, um, uh, just a reminder that um, uh, click on the exit link, uh, and you'll be redirected to a short evaluation survey. We really appreciate everyone's feedback to help us plan for future events. So uh, please take take a take a minute or two to do that. Thank you so much.